Hi, everyone. It's Mike. Over the years, a number of listeners have asked about what we do in my lab at Georgia Tech. Well, now you have a chance to find out. Today, we're cross-posting a recent episode of the outstanding Sustainable Nano podcast, on which I was a recent guest. The Sustainable Nano podcast is a production of the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. In this episode, Miriam Krauss, the show's host, and I talk about my lab's recent push towards what I like to call hyperscalable electronics, and what technologies might be enabled by such a manufacturing capability. I had an absolute blast recording this show, and I hope you have as much fun listening to it. Welcome to the Sustainable Nano Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Krauss. So it's hard to believe we are starting season four. For any new listeners, welcome. For others, welcome back. We've been on a sort of extended summer hiatus, um, so I'm really excited to be starting our new season. For our first episode, we've got an interview with Dr. Mike Filler, who is an associate professor and the Taylor Faculty Fellow in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, otherwise known as Georgia Tech. He and his lab are doing some really cool stuff with nano wires, and he's going to tell us all about that. Uh, he also has a, his own podcast called Nanovation, so we'll get to chat a little bit about podcasting. But before we get to that, we're trying something new this season, which is to do a little mini-interview at the top of each episode on a topic that is timely for the week the podcast is going out. So in this case, here we are, it is late October, and we're getting ready for Halloween this week, and in that spirit, pun intended, uh, I have asked graduate student Natalie Hudson-Smith here to talk a little bit about necrochemistry. Now, we are going to be talking some about death, um, I think not in a graphic way, but if you would rather not hear this part of the interview, I suggest just skipping ahead about five and a half minutes, and then uh, you'll get to the next section of the podcast. So Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm a graduate student with the Center for Sustainable Nano, and I have a blog post coming out. That's right. Yeah. So uh, cross advertising here for Sustainable Nano folks. We also have a blog. You should check out Natalie's post coming out on Halloween this week. So I I asked Natalie to come here and talk a little bit about the topic of that post, which is necrochemistry. What is necrochemistry? Uh, It's sort of the opposite of biochemistry. So biochemistry is like a, a standard class you might have if you major in chemistry or if you major in biochemistry or biology. So biochemistry is the study of the chemistry of life. Necrochemistry is the study of the chemistry of death. And often it refers to post-mortem chemistry or forensic chemistry. But I use this word when I'm thinking about like the chemistry of mortuary science or preservation or other aspects of death that may or may not be necessarily crime solving. And how, like, how is necrochemistry different from biochemistry? Biochemistry, I just think of like cells doing stuff. So what's different in this case? So... I was thinking about this. I struggle with this a little bit. It's honestly not exactly opposite, but sort of, right? So when a human body dies, all the processes that you learn about in biochemistry, like our metabolism and, you know, keeping our cells, having the right concentration of salt, that all stops. So you can't study that anymore. On the other hand, your bacteria that live in your body and the bacteria that will colonize you when you die get to have a a free party. So um, they sort of have their biochemistry becomes a little bit more interesting, but their biochemistry can be a part of your death chemistry. Interesting. Um, so there's overlap. For sure. There is overlap, right. Cool. And you do use biochemical tools to understand necrochemical situations. So Exciting. it's just a kind of a subset. Yeah. So, you know, Halloween is kind of this like silly, spooky holiday that we often people don't take very seriously, but on a kind of a serious note, obviously this um, can be a very somber topic. How Mm -hmm. how did you get interested in it? Uh, I really got into it through the Ask a Mortician YouTube channel, which is run primarily by Caitlin Dowdy and the Order of the Good Death, which is a death positive organization that believes that, especially in U.S. culture, we should talk about death more. We're not very good at it. We have a really commercialized, yeah, 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 like, like if your family member dies, usually you, you know, call a mortician and they do all of the processing, embalming, and they organize all of that for you. And that's not actually standard in most places in the world. To and depersonalize. There are, yeah. There are implications that this makes our grief process harder because we are so separated from it. Um, so they have a lot of resources out to talk about, like, death and why you should talk about it and how to talk about it, even though it's hard. And what about it is actually kind of interesting, mm-hmm. even though it's a little creepy spooky. Mm-hmm. 
That makes sense. So can you give us a little teaser for your blog post that's coming out yeah. on Halloween? So our blog post is going to have a lot of like resources about death. And I just picked out two really famous corpses. There's a number of famous corpses in the world. But one of them is Lady Dai. And she was part of a Chinese dynasty. And she died in 168 BC. So she, there was over 2,000 years from her death to her discovery. And she was remarkably well preserved. She still had like hair and eyelashes. Her skin was soft and like it was pale, but it was still skin, like looking pretty good considering. And part of this is probably because her tomb was like nesting dolls. There were like a coffin inside a coffin inside a coffin inside a coffin. So four layers. And there was some unknown liquid that had like gathered inside that tomb that may have helped keep her preserved. And we know a lot about her because she was so well preserved. She died in the summer, which we know because her stomach had 138 melon seeds. So she had to have recently eaten melons before she died and they were ripe in the summer during that time. So she's a fascinating case. Uh, and the other one that I looked into is the soap lady. So there's a process called saponification where fatty lipids turn into soap. And when this happens to a human body, it's called corpse wax or adipose air. Um, anaerobic bacteria help make it. So that's you know, part of their part. biochemistry, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it comes from your body fat. So the more body fat you have, the more likely you will form adipose air if the conditions are right. And it generally forms a sort of casing around the body so that you can still like look at facial features and keeps all the, the would be gooey bits on the inside kind of protected. Um, you can see a corpse like this in Philadelphia at the Mutter Museum. So I think ACS is often in Philadelphia, so it's a great place to hit up if you're a chemist looking to get into more necrochemistry. Subway is very famous. Okay, so for the sake of time, we won't go too much in depth into the chemistry of this, but it's really interesting, and we will put links in the show notes to this episode, and I strongly encourage everyone to read the blog post that has information about this and lots and lots of other information. So um, thank you so much for joining us for our first uh, little mini interview, and... For our listeners, I hope you have a happy Halloween. And without further ado, we will now go on to my interview with Professor Mike Filler about nanowires and other non-Halloween topics. So yeah, well, welcome to the Sustainable Nano Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Filler. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at Georgia Tech, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. So to start off, um, how did you get started as a scientist? How did you get to where you are? Um, Lego, probably. You know, nice. from a young age, it was always uh, something that I couldn't put down. Um, there are these pictures from when I was a kid in the house of these expansive kind of layouts that I would just keep building onto. And, you know, I would combine Lego with model trains. So you'd have like these big Lionel trains driving through Lego cities and They'd rumble all the Lego people and they'd fall over. But it was fun to combine Lego and other things that I loved as a kid. Um, beyond that, I, I kind of fell into it. Uh, my mom was a teacher, my dad a lawyer, and what I knew I didn't want to do was write as much as my dad. And, of course, now as a professor, I write all the time. <laughs> But I kind of fell into chemical engineering. I think a lot of people fall into chemical engineering because of the engineering disciplines, it is the one of them that you don't see on a regular basis as an average person. It affects everyone's life, but you don't see chemical plants unless you live like in northern New Jersey or something like that. And so people don't have a real sense for what chemical engineers do. And so you come to the discipline because you enjoy mathematics, because you enjoy Lego, and because you enjoy chemistry. Um, which I always tell my students that I mentor now is not the good reason to be a chemical engineer, <laughs> but that's how I came to it. And uh, luckily I liked it and I stayed um, and found this niche in semiconductors that I really love. And uh, luckily they let me do it. Awesome. So uh, that actually leads really nicely into what, what is a semiconductor and what does that have to do with nanotechnology? Yeah, I think so. Semiconductors are the materials we build uh, electronics out of computer chips and in terms of nanotechnology, I actually think a lot of the field of nanotechnology emerged from the way we thought of and the way we build integrated circuits. Um, 
in terms of the specific work that my laboratory does, we work a lot with um, nanomaterials known as nanowires. These are basically one-dimensional whisker-like or fiber-like semiconductors. They can be several microns long, and maybe they're tens to hundreds of nanometers in diameter. And the really valuable thing from the perspective of these materials is is not the materials themselves so much, it's the synthesis. So the way we make these fibers is with a technique that's called uh, the vapor liquid solid mechanism. And so I'll just kind of describe what happens. You have a vapor um, you can deliver in a reactor, and it contains maybe semiconductor uh, precursors or precursors containing semiconductor atoms and maybe other precursors containing dopant atoms that you use to control the conductivity in different regions of a semiconductor. And you, you flow them into a reactor, and that's the vapor part. And then they collect in these little seed particles. Uh, they're little droplets, uh, and they basically collect in there and get concentrated. And when they reach supersaturation, you precipitate from that liquid a solid semiconductor nanowire. And the cool thing from the perspective of this technique is I can modify what I deliver in the vapor, which then modifies what goes into the droplet, and then that changes what the crystal structure is or the composition. And so we, in the field, call it programming or encoding of crystal structure or composition along the length of these fibers, because that's how they've been grown. And that's critical because electronic devices, for example, coming back to electronics, are multi composition. Uh, You have a transistor, and there you have a source, a channel, and a drain. So the source is where charge carriers or electrons come from. They traverse the channel and end up in the drain, and we control their ability to move through the channel by an electric field. But you need a region of the wire to be a source. You need a region to be a channel and a region to be a drain. And so the the value of this technique is not in the wire's one dimensionality. It's in, I can encode these different regions directly during synthesis. And that, I think, is a really important thing um, for these kinds of materials and their way they're grown. And how does the nanoscale aspect of it yeah. <laughs> is that inherently important or is it kind of comes from the technique that you're using? It's a great question. So I think when the nanowire community first got going about two decades ago, let's say, people were excited to make things really small. And we kind of got to the point where we realized there were all sorts of opportunities at the 20 to 50 nanometer diameter, which for a lot of the materials that we look at in my community, silicon being one of them, or let's say something more exotic like gallium arsenide, these are not behaving nano-like at these dimensions. Uh, These are pretty bulk-like in their properties. So again, it comes back to the value is in the synthesis, the process by which they can be made. And I mean, I think you can do lots of things if you kept shrinking. We kind of, kind of haven't gotten there yet. But you know, people who do nanocrystals are always in the region where these things are tiny enough to have nanoscale effects. But we we tend not to be there as much. Although it's, I'm not exactly sure why we stopped <laughs> shrinking. So on your lab website, it says that you specialize in synthesis, understanding, and deployment of nanoscale materials to enable new electronic, photonic, and energy technologies. Can you talk a little bit about what what that means? What are those technologies that you're dealing with? Right. So first, uh, the synthesis, understanding, and deployment. So the synthesis is understanding this growth technique I was talking about. Because it's pretty complex. There's three phases, a vapor, a liquid, and solid. There's some interfaces between these phases. And so the details... Are, are still murky, to be honest. Uh, we can draw beautiful PowerPoint pictures, but they often don't correspond to experiment. So we have to understand the synthesis. Uh, we hope to be able to then leverage the growth technique to be able to make new compositions, new, let's say, super lattices or new combinations of materials along the lengths of wires that you couldn't do other ways. And then what are the new physical phenomena that emerge there? And then finally, and this is where I put my chemical engineering hat on, what are the processes that would allow us to deploy these on the scale of chemical engineering? Um, And to me, that's one of the most exciting things about nanomaterials and nanomanufacturing is being able to bring things that are thought of in a certain way to different contexts. And one being, and I can talk about this more, say electronics at the scale of chemicals manufacturing. 
So that, I guess, gets into the enabling new electronic, photonic, and energy technologies. So when you say at the scale of chemical engineering or manufacturing, does that mean like at the scale where you're making enough stuff for like consumers to buy as opposed to just making one in your lab at a time kind of thing? It's partly that. It's partly um, that we, for example, in electronics don't make that many electronics on a kind of per year or per time basis. It feels like we do. It feels like they're everywhere. But relative to all sorts of other things enabled by chemical engineering, whether it's fuels, whether it's textiles, whether it's uh, paper, all sorts of things that are around us every day, electronics are produced in much, much smaller quantities. And what gets me excited about nanomanufacturing and the work we're doing with nanowire devices, just to give you an example, is that we're developing processes that can produce as many transistors in one day as the entire semiconductor industry produces in one year. And so that changes what you can do with electronics. It changes how you think about deploying electronics. And those are the kinds of things I get very excited about. One example might be, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had simple sensors in every tissue so that when we blew our nose, not only would that tissue detect some sort of virus, but then be able to wirelessly communicate that to my phone, my doctor, whoever, and let me know that, oh, I need to you know, go pick up some medicine for this. Or in the case of, let's say, crops, it'd be really cool if we could deploy electronics, perhaps, sounds crazy, but perhaps on every seed we plant so that we can improve the efficiency of farming, knowing when every seed germinates. Assuming the electronic systems are cheap enough, and we hope this would emerge over time from scaling electronics like I'm talking about, I think there are these kinds of applications which you would just never think would be the kind of thing that you would do with electronics. But by changing the processing, I think you can get there. That's fascinating. So where would you say we're at now from the scale of a refrigerator is <laughs> normal electronics or, or a radio or whatever right. to a nano transistor in every seed? Yeah, right. Part of it is is uh, mindset, because I don't think uh, most people think you can do that. I mean, we're kind of at the end of Moore's Law. We've been reducing the cost of transistors and circuits for a long time. That's oh, yeah. For those who, who don't know, can you give a quick, what is Moore's Law? Yeah, Moore's Law is uh, law in quotes, okay? so But it's basically this idea that every certain period of time, we can pack more and more transistors onto a computer chip. The real point of Moore's Law is economic, though that these transistors also get cheaper. You know, Intel can't sell you more transistors and say, oh, by the way, they're going to be twice as expensive this time. <laughs> they have to be cheaper, otherwise no one will buy the chips. And that's Moore's Law. And, and that has more or less been, finally, after being predicted to be the end game for decades, probably, is seeming like we're kind of there. But I would argue it's, we're there in the conventional way at which we process integrated circuits. And, and that was a process developed in the 1950s, and it's been tremendously successful, of course. But it was just a process, and I think if we view processing differently, we'll be able to continue lowering the cost of electronic devices and probably simple electronic systems, combinations of devices going forward. So my lab works on what are the processes that you need to demonstrate to make that future a reality. So we're still, you know, it's a couple decades, but that's, if you don't start to think about these things and think what processes do I need in place, then you're, you're never going to get there. So we might as well start. Right. That's exciting. Um, since we're the Sustainable Nano Podcast, we always like to ask people about how research relates to sustainability. Do you, do you think a lot about that in your work? I think we have to. Um, chemical engineers always have to. At least they do today. They didn't, they didn't have to maybe a couple decades ago. Uh, and this is always one of those double-edged swords with my field. But like, take the electronics work, right? So what I described maybe sounded really great on the one hand, in terms of like the seed example, but does that lead to a lot of silicon waste out in fields? right? How do silicon transistors degrade in soil, if you were to do that? Do they get incorporated into food? You could argue very similar things in terms of putting electronics in tissues um, or in medicine or what have you, right? So I, I personally am kind of a big believer in recognizing that all impactful technologies are a double-edged sword. 
doesn't matter what it is. Uh, there will be enormous positives and there will be negatives. And it's just incumbent upon us to understand as best we can the negatives, not sweep them under the rug. But it's not a reason to not develop the technology in the first place. And to maybe try to anticipate a little bit. Right. Um, this is I always find an interesting question. Uh, and I think I asked Bob Hamers about this when he was on my podcast. How do you do that? I, I think of lots of examples where it was really hard or, or not really possible to anticipate until we discovered a problem after the fact. Again, it's not the we shouldn't not try, but it seems really hard to a priori anticipate. Um, I think about like MTBE, uh, methyl tert-butyl ether, which was used as an oxygenate in fuels after we got rid of lead in fuel. And it sounded like, oh, this is great. We're getting rid of lead. Lead is really harmful. But unfortunately, MTBE started to seep into the groundwater. It started to show up in drinking water. And that really was not good, but hard to have predicted ahead of time that it would have had those problems. Right. And especially then when you get any human behavior and large scale groups of human behavior involved in anything, it can be challenging. Oh, oh yeah. (laughs) That's an understatement. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So... Oh, one last scientific question. So you talked about the electronics, which is fascinating. Um, wh- what is photonics? That's also something that, that your group works on. Right. So photonics is, is basically manipulation of light. How do you guide light? How do you absorb light? How do you emit light? And people want to use that capability for all sorts of applications. You know, one area that people talk about a lot in terms of photonics is in sending data across chips or between chips. Because light moves really quick relative to electrons. So that could be a great way to speed up integrated circuits if you could send that data in terms of as photons instead of electrons. Uh, We are very interested in photonic thermal uh, transport. The idea that photons can carry heat energy uh, and that we can apply kind of similar concepts that are thought about for electrical connection to the movement of heat. And some of our work has shown that if you create an appropriate structure in a nanowire, that you can, in fact, guide heat energy and that you can do it with an efficiency that rivals that which is possible with electrons and phonons, phonons being the vibrations of materials. Since the time of Einstein, we've mostly thought that in solids, heat moves through electron movement, where the electrons carry heat, and phonons, that these vibrations, just the motion of atoms in a solid carries heat as well. And it seems to be, our results seem to indicate that there's this third component, which is light can move the energy as well. Um, And here it's one of those things where we know light moves energy. Everyone who stands out in the sun knows light from the sun is bringing energy to your skin. You feel it on a sunny day. But we haven't grappled, I think, with the idea that light inside materials can move heat around and so we're we're working on that and that's one of those things where being able to grow the kinds of nanowires we grow and create the structures in wires that we do which is challenging other ways allows us to make interesting new engineered materials that can do this kind of thing for the first time so it's not heat movement obviously but is this is photonics is that the principle behind like fiber optic wires exactly and so there it's you have a light source you create a photon and that photon travels down a fiber you can think of this very similarly it's just a much smaller dimension it's now nanoscale in radius basically it's a nanowire and we don't start with like a light emitter we we start with heat and we let the heat do the work to create some photons and then once we've created the photons we send them down the the wire awesome I feel like we could probably talk for another hour about that, but uh, <laughs> switching gears a little bit, I know that you have won some awards for teaching as well as for your research. Can you talk a little about your approach to teaching and how you kind of incorporate that into your academic life? Yeah, I think it's two things. It's challenging and engaging students. So in my experience, students want to be challenged. You know, you don't want to steamroll them, but you want to challenge them, and they just hunger for that challenge, and you want to engage them in something meaningful, and they're hungering for that too. And to me, that's that's 90% of the challenge. Uh, if you can do both those things, then you're you're doing really well, and that, that cuts across student learning abilities. It cuts across backgrounds. Those, to me, are pretty universal among students, and so I tend to focus a lot of my efforts in those two areas. 
One of the things I'll tell students oftentimes is when you have a good professor in one of your classes and, and you're at a place like Georgia Tech, you know, tier one research institutions, you should thank them because they, they do it for the love of teaching and the love of watching students, the next generation of scientists and engineers prepare for their careers uh, and not for any other reason. There are very few incentives to be a good teacher other than the kind of the altruistic um, reason. Yeah, which is also, that's kind of a systemic challenge or, or problem um, in academia, in my opinion. But I agree. Um, but, you know, I think it's great that despite that lack of incentives, you find the find it rewarding to pursue that. So um, any advice for people who are considering a career in science, academia or otherwise, whether it's current grad students or, or even younger folks who are in high school or undergrads thinking about being a scientist? Yeah, I think I think you should do it. I think um, we have a weird thing in our culture where science and engineering is viewed by the average person as not creative. Uh, and that I think is starting to change, but it's it's been a frustrating thing for me because it's I find just as creative as art or, or anything else that we attribute with quote unquote creativity. So if you're a creative person listening, don't shy away from science and engineering. Unfortunately, the way we teach science and engineering just lacks creativity. Uh, we make you, you know, derive things and you have to check to see if the solution matches. And so there's very little creativity there. And I think we do an enormous disservice to the discipline by pushing away people who are excited about the creativity and may struggle a bit more with the mathematical rigor in the beginning. We end up with people who are mathematical rigorous a lot of the times and maybe not as creative. And so that we should we should think about. I also think people should dream big. If you miss, you've still made it to the moon. And um, when you're doing something big, it's hard for someone to shut it down immediately. I think that people tend to be very cynical and think that things won't work. But if you're thinking big enough and there's enough space between today and this exciting future – then it's harder for someone to find the thing that brings you down, if that makes sense. The flip side is that there's a longer path, and you have to be comfortable with that. But I do think dreaming big is important to do. I also think it's important to recognize that you're onto something when 50% of people say it's awesome and 50% of people say it's the most ridiculous thing they've ever heard. Somewhere right in the middle. Yeah. So is your, would you say your big dream that you're kind of working on now is the nanoscale of electronics we were talking about? Yeah. And that's exactly that. You get certain people in certain disciplines to be like, oh, transistors as chemicals. Why haven't we, th that sounds cool. And then you get people in other disciplines, uh, electronics people uh, who there's no way you can't you can't drive down the cost of a transistor orders of magnitude and even if you did how are you going to interconnect them and yada 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 all the reasons why it can't work exactly so but that means i think we're on to something and we'll just keep pulling the thread and and we'll see where it goes yeah do you have a particular like step that you're working on at the moment that you're excited about yeah, I think one of the things that we've had some success on recently that we're working on finishing up and publishing is patterning in a fully bottom-up process. So a little bit of backstory there. Uh, one of the most expensive steps in conventional integrated circuit manufacturing is what's called photolithography, the step by which we pattern the different features on chips. We pattern the transistors and we pattern the wires that connect the transistors. And uh, it's very expensive. It's getting more and more expensive every day. Modern tools, this blows my mind. Uh, I think about this stuff regularly. A modern tool is like $130 million for one tool to do lithography. I mean, it's just crazy. So it, it works really well to make the highly integrated systems that we've come to expect on our current integrated circuits. But it, it's limited in terms of scale. So one of the reasons we don't produce very many devices because of steps like this. So what we're trying to do is create more what we would call bottom-up steps, more chemicals-like steps or processes to create patterns that help us make the transistors. How do we make transistors make themselves? We, we tell molecules to do that. That's what the chemical engineer does. We coax molecules, usually smaller building blocks, to react with each other to form something bigger and more functional. And so if we think about the same idea from a transistor perspective, we have already can do growth of these wires to put source channel drain. And a key stumbling block is how do you then put the electrode that is what we call the gate, which is the switch part. That 
the community has largely resorted even though they've made these beautiful nanostructures in a chemicals-like process, they've then put them down on surfaces and resorted to conventional patterning techniques like lithography to make this gate, the switch. And wouldn't it be great if, like a molecule, you could just coax the gate to form itself? And that's something we've had um, some success with lately. And so I'm very excited about that breakthrough. Awesome. So yeah, we're I've, I've gone on probably longer than I should have, but we definitely have to talk about your podcast, Nanovation. Uh, how did that come about? And do you have any favorite episodes that you'd recommend to new listeners who haven't heard it before? Yeah, thanks. This is um, this is, so Bob Hamers was was on Nanovation. You know, Bob has been kind of a role model to me. I mean, he was running a lab that my lab in my graduate training competed against. It was friendly competition, but we competed. And so, you know, I've, I've followed Bob's career for a long time now. But so he came on my, my podcast. And the podcast is a labor of love. I still find that most of my senior colleagues don't get it, and that's fine. Um, but I'm personally enamored, of course, by nanotechnology. But then I'm enamored by the low cost of communications enabled by the Internet and what the opportunities are for educators. The fact that the marginal cost of sending another byte is effectively $0, you know, you're, it changes everything. You add a zero into the equation, right? Whereas if I needed to send you a newsletter in the mail, that's non, not $0 for another newsletter. So what are the opportunities? And um, particularly in a space like nanotechnology, which is very focused, but there, if you take the globe, maybe there's, let's say, 10 to maybe 50,000 people or more working on things related to nanotechnology. Conventionally, you would never be able to get kind of an audio discussion out to that kind of audience because it was too focused. It was too expensive, too focused. But that's the beauty of the internet is that we can now have basically this kind of this rainforest uh, of different, very focused topics. You can find anything. And this is what's so exciting, I think, about podcasting in general, not just for nanotech. So I can reach on the podcast more people in you know a couple of episodes than I've reached in the last 10 years of teaching in the classroom. And that's just kind of mind boggling to me. I love the rainforest analogy. Can you unpack that a little more? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, in the old days, you would have just these kind of old growth trees, right? The, if you think about media, you'd have, let's just say for TV, you'd have CBS, ABC, NBC in the United States. And they're the only ones with deep enough pockets to produce the content. And there's probably a better analogy with actually radio versus TV since this is a podcast. But I think you get the idea. And, and now... What's happening is you're getting this kind of all the growth that happens on the bottom of the rainforest that's just much smaller plants and, and things flourishing because they can, because the marginal cost of a, another bite is zero. And that's just, that's just super exciting to find anything, even really specific things like nanotech that you might be interested in. So that's the analogy, yeah. Yeah, awesome. So any any particular episodes that new listeners should jump in on, or do you think they should just start with number one and go from there? Um, so you can do whatever you want. I, I really have – they're not meant to be listened to in sequence, or you don't have to listen to them in sequence. I'd like to think I've gotten better at being a host over the last couple of years. But we, we are pretty open in terms of topic. We very loosely sometimes connect it back to nanotechnology. So – on the nanotechnology side, we've had um, like my colleague Dennis Hess, who was at Fairchild Semiconductor uh, early in his career, so he's seen a lot of the history of the silicon IC industry, and we were able to talk about that history. I've had my colleague Matt McDowell, who's an expert in battery materials, come on the show. That was a fun one. Greg Parsons, who's an expert in a technique known as atomic layer deposition, was recently on. Of course, Bob Hamers. And those are the kind of the, the science-y ones. And then we've had kind of things on the edges. Uh, we've had Ivan Oransky from a website called Retraction Watch, which was really fun. He was really gracious to do it. It's a website that watches for retractions in the literature. I've had a guy named Sebastian Lunis from an organization called Cyclotron Road, which is out of uh, Lawrence Berkeley. Um, they are basically a startup incubator for hard tech. So People who are in science engineering that want to translate their research into technologies. They're trying to help those of us who don't do software, which seems to be the focus of most you know, VC money and things like that. They're trying to help get you the resources you need in the first couple of years to demonstrate 
the technology from you know s- the starting point, which was maybe a publication in the lab or from the lab. So we've had a whole variety of different people you know come on the show, and um, I love it because I get to talk to just fascinating people. And even one person's become a collaborator, which I also love. Uh, Kira Barton from the University of Michigan works with this technique known as electrohydrodynamic printing. And if you think about the transistor stuff I was talking about, you need to interconnect them. You do need to connect a couple transistors at least together with electrical wiring. And so her technique uh, is really this remarkable technique that allows you to print those metal lines with really tiny dimensions. And it's just a very exciting technique. So I stumbled upon the collaboration because someone else suggested I have her on the show. And then by the end of the discussion, I realized, wait a minute. We need to talk in the after show about her possibly testing or looking at some of our samples. I love it. That's fantastic. Well, we've hit 30 minutes, so I should let you go. But this is fascinating. Thank you so much for for talking with us. And it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about nanotechnology and teaching and podcasting. My pleasure. And and thanks for doing what you do. I think uh, the more of these kinds of things that we have, uh, the better for the whole field. And that's it for this episode of the Sustainable Nano Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thank you again to Dr. Mike Filler and Natalie Hudson-Smith for talking with us for today's episode. This podcast is produced by the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. Our usual disclaimer, though, the opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the National Science Foundation. Our music is by PC3 and Dexter Britton. Want more Sustainable Nano? You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcast or Stitcher or listen to any of our episodes and see show notes at podcast.sustainable-nano.com. We also have a blog with close to 300 posts at this point, mostly written by students in the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology, and you can find that at sustainable-nano.com. You can also reach out to us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Sustainable Nano, all one word. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks again for listening to the Sustainable Nano Podcast, and remember, sometimes it's the little things in life that matter the most.